Hi, I'm Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health here at East Tennessee State University, and I want to talk to you about what I think is one of the greatest problems in global health, and particularly global public health, and that is the health status of the world's children. And I think there's five reasons why, in order to understand what we need to do to improve health around the world, you have to understand the health of the world's children. And those five reasons are, first of all, of course, because there are a lot of children in the world, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Secondly, many of them are dying as children. They're not growing up to be adults, and that's an important issue to understand. The third issue is that the, the deaths of children is unequally distributed around the world, which makes it fundamentally a global health problem. And fourthly, most of the th causes of death for these kids are things that could be easily prevented and cured. And there's a fifth reason why I think it's important to study the health of children, but I'll get that to the, at the end of this talk. So let's go through each of these. There are a lot of children in the world today. Well, that's certainly true. There are a lot of people in the world today. As of uh, October 31st, 2011, Halloween 2011, the world's population passed 7 billion. And this is a screenshot that I took as that population change happen. As dramatic as that is, uh, by the middle of 2018, so less than seven years later, the world's population has already grown to 7.6 billion. So in less than seven years, 600 million people have been added to the population of the earth. A couple of interesting ways to think about that. One is that the net gain of people every day is about 200,000 a day. In other words, every day 200,000 more people are born than die. That means that in every single month the entire population of Tennessee is added to the world's population, month after month after month. Another way to think about it is that my grandparents were born in the 1890s and early 1900s. Since they were born, the world's population has quadrupled, four times as many people in the world. My dad was born in 1927, and he's still living today. In his lifetime, the world's population has tripled. I was born in 1955. In my lifetime, the world's population has doubled. Think about that. Twice as many people on the planet Earth today as when I was born. And of course, every single person added to the population came in as a baby. So that means there are a whole lot of young people in the world today. In fact, over a quarter of the world's population is under the age of 15. That means every single one of them is dependent on the other three quarters for food, for shelter, for education, for opportunity, for life, for jobs. And 650 million are under the age of five who are completely dependent. So if you look at this chart, this bar chart showing the distribution of age uh, in five-year increments, you see a whole lot of young people in the world. So any effort to understand or improve global health has to address the issues of kids because they are the fastest growing group and there's so many of them in the world. The second issue and the second reason why it's important to understand the health status of the world's children is because so many of them are dying as children. So in 2016, it was estimated that five and a half million kids died before the age of five. Five and a half million kids in the world died before the age of five. To give you a sense of what that means, that's the same as if we lost one quarter of all the young kids in our country in a single year. Can you imagine the tragedy of losing one quarter? of the under five kids in America in a single year, and yet that's what's happening around the world every year, year after year. That's the equivalent of 600, 600 excuse me, young kids dying every hour. In less time than it has taken us to talk in this lecture up to this point, all the kids in this picture would be dead. In the time it takes to read this sentence aloud, another child has died somewhere in the world. Minute after minute, hour after hour, five and a half million kids in a year. 
that's clearly a major public health challenge, a major global health challenge, and another reason why it's so important to pay attention to the health of kids around the world. Unfortunately, these deaths are not evenly distributed around the world. If you look at this map, you can see those countries, those parts of the world where child death is more common, but perhaps this is more helpful. This is a bar chart that looks at continents, simply by continent. And what you can see is the under five mortality is eight times higher in Africa than it is in Europe. This is a chart, that, this is a, a graph that shows the highest under five mortality in the world, that's Somalia with 126. That means for every eight babies born in Somalia, one will die before the age of five. At the same time, Finland, Finland has the lowest under five mortality at 1.95. So a 60-fold difference between Finland and Somalia. Now, why is that? Well, this is a chart that comes from Gapminder. Every dot on this chart is a country. The size of the dot represents the population, so you can see China and India there in the middle in red. The color represents the continent. Blue is Africa, red is Asia, uh, yellow is Europe, green is the Americas. And on the left side is under five mortality. So healthy countries are low, unhealthy countries are high. Across the bottom is per capita income. Rich countries on the right, poor countries on the left, and there's Somalia with an in, uh, under five mortality of 126, the poorest country in the world. There's Finland, one of the richest countries, though not the richest, with an under five mortality of less than two. And what you can see is a very strong linear relationship. In other words, kids are dying in poor countries and not dying in rich countries, pretty consistently across the board. And perhaps what's most disturbing about this is that all of us sort of think that's to be expected. Sure, kids are going to die in poor countries, they aren't going to die in rich countries. But you ask yourself, why? If that were to be true, that they should die more in poor countries, we'd have to be saying, well, they must have unusual diseases, tropical diseases, rare diseases, diseases that we can't prevent or cure. But as it turns out, most of these deaths are not due to some exotic disease, but rather due to conditions that we could prevent or could treat. So this is a simple pie chart that shows what causes kids to die under the age of the five worldwide. And you can see that 40% are due to conditions of the neonatal period, prematurity, small birth weight, birth asphyxia predominantly. Then 14% of the deaths are due to pneumonia, a very common condition that can be treated with antibiotics that cost less than a dollar and in some cases can be prevented with vaccines. Diarrhea is second but 10% of the deaths can be prevented in some cases with vaccine, but more commonly with safe, basic sanitation, food and water. It can be treated with oral rehydration solutions that cost pennies. The next one is malaria. Malaria can be treated. I had malaria as a kid. Uh, I was treated for it. It can be prevented with impregnated bed nets, residual spraying, and so on. The next is measles, can be prevented with a vaccine. The next is HIV AIDS. Remember, this is under five mortality. So these are kids that are infected during the birth process from their moms that can be largely prevented by treating moms during the perinatal period. Next is injury. Again, just as in our country, most injuries can be prevented, uh, non-communicable diseases and so on. And if you add in uh, neonatal diarrhea, ne ne neonatal pneumonia, you can see that almost a third of all of the deaths of kids in the world are due to those two conditions, pneumonia and diarrhea. Easily prevented, easily treated, easily cured. As you might expect, death due to pneumonia and diarrhea are not evenly distributed in the world with about half uh, taking place in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and most of the rest in South Asia. This next pie chart is almost mind-boggling. Uh, it shows death due to pneumonia and diarrhea in industrialized countries and developing countries, and it's so uneven that you can almost not see uh, industrialized countries. In fact, half of all of the deaths due to pneumonia and diarrhea occur in five countries, and three-quarters occur in the 13 countries on this list. So. I say that most of these deaths are due to conditions that we could prevent or treat. 
And you might say, well, Dr. Wyckoff, that's theoretically fine. Uh, you can say that these are preventable and treatable, but really, functionally, it would be very, very difficult for us to prevent or treat these diseases. After all, they're occurring in 200 countries around the world and some of the most isolated places in the world. And really, realistically, we as Western society can't be expected to realistically think that we could do that. Well, I would argue with you, and I would say there's actually a precedent that shows us otherwise, and that's this, I this item right here. You may not recognize this, but you'll recognize these pictures. That's the polio virus. And the reason I want to talk to you about polio is in 1980s, Rotary International decided to work with many other organizations to try to eradicate this disease. When they started in 1988, polio existed in 125 countries around the world, all the countries shown in red. By last year, less than 30 years later, it's down to three countries. During that time, it's estimated that 10 million cases of paralysis have been prevented and polio has been reduced by 99.9%. .9%. Yes, I'm sure back in the 80s there were people that said, well, this is too big a challenge, right? It's, it's, it's more than we can do. There's cases of polio all over the world. Some of them are in the most isolated places in the world, just like diarrhea, just like pneumonia. Well, if we could prevent and treat these conditions, why aren't we? Why aren't they being prevented or treated? Well, we go back to this chart, and what we can see is that what we need to do is that those countries that have the resources need to be able to invest them in those countries that don't. I often think about our legacy as a generation, as a people. You know, we often look back into history with, with our current perspective. And we say, how did those people, a couple of hundred years ago, how did they allow public executions? How did people in our country allow slavery? How did we tolerate segregation? We look back and we judge previous generations. And I ask from time to time, how will our great-grandchildren and their children judge us? I think they'll look back at us and say, wait a minute, you had two million kids die from diarrhea and from pneumonia that could be treated for pennies or dollars. You had a million and a half people die from tuberculosis. You have hundreds of thousands dying from measles. All of these can be treated and prevented. And why didn't you do it? Why couldn't you figure out how we could take the resources that we have in abundance? Remember, virtually no kids are dying in developed countries from these conditions and yet we're not doing it. And so I mentioned earlier that there are five reasons why I think we need to study the health of children in the world. One is because there are a lot of kids. Two, because many of them are dying before they reach their fifth birthday. Three, these are not evenly distributed around the world and most of these conditions can be prevented or treated, but ultimately it puts into clear context what we need to do to improve health for all people around the world. We need to work together to take our knowledge, our capacity, our resources, and apply them to the challenges that we have today. The biggest problem in global health, the biggest problem in global pediatrics, isn't kids dying from conditions for which we don't have uh, treatments or prevention, but rather the fact that we aren't preventing and treating them. That, I think, is the greatest challenge in global health. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry I'm not there to answer questions, but I, I hope this has been helpful to you.